because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. On this week's episode, we're once again covering the 2020 elections, specifically the role of energy in the elections and more broadly, the role of freedom, particularly economic freedom in these elections. And I'm going to be joined by one of the most influential pro-freedom people in politics, David McIntosh of the Club for Growth. And one exciting thing that's happened in the last week is the Club for Growth, which has 250,000 members, has publicly promoted energytalkingpoints.com and shared it with their candidate. So I wanted to bring David on to discuss that decision, as well as the broader energy and freedom landscape in the 2020 elections. Hope you enjoy this interview, and I'll be back with you on the other side. I'm joined now by David McIntosh, president of the Club for Growth. David, welcome to Power Hour. Uh, Thanks, Alex. It's great to be with you today. All right. Good uh, good to see you again. I think we met two years or so ago at an event at the Teneo uh, event, which is a really interesting group of kind of networked uh, free market people. Do you remember us meeting them? I do, and I, I also really remember your wonderful presentation to them about uh, human flourishing and the need for you know, carbon-based energy to be part of that. You, you were very, very compelling in your presentation. And I think I rushed up to the Edwards afterwards and said, we need to meet. Uh, I fight for these issues all the time. Yeah, well, I, I really appreciated that. Uh, you, you, your opinion wasn't so unanimous that you couldn't make it to me. Uh, but no, is there, and I got to know you in the Club for Growth. So let's, let's talk about that first, because this is a, mainly an energy podcast, and we're going to talk some energy, but also some broader pro-freedom issues. So tell us, uh, for those who don't know, what is the Club for Growth? Yeah, so the Club for Growth is the largest advocacy group for free markets, pro-growth, and limited government. Uh, we, we try to further those goals, somewhat advocating for issues on Capitol Hill, but mainly through our two political committees, our PAC and our super PAC, to elect champions for those issues, men and women who in their DNA will fight for freedom and free markets and less government. And we've, we now have really become quite a force for that in the Republican side of the political aisle. Uh, this cycle will be raising and spending over 80 million for all of our different projects. Most of that going to the elections of some really great leaders. You know, in the past we've helped people like Ted Cruz, Mike Lee, Actually, early on, Mike Pence was supported by the Club for Growth, um, Ben Sass, a whole range of people. Uh, and we're, this, I'm very proud of the people we're supporting now. You, you probably haven't heard any of their names, but they're going to be new members of Congress who are articulate, they're smart, and they understand freedom. And, and as you apply it to the energy sector or almost any problem, why the free market will give you a better solution. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I want to dive a little bit into how this works. So how do you how do you find these candidates? How do you you uh, vet them? Because I'm I'm assuming there are many people who want your money and want to be promoted by you, but then of course you have to have clear standards to yeah. choose people. So how does that whole process work? So, and we've got a very rigorous process of of researching them. I, I have three field directors. They're out, and their mission is to think a couple elections ahead and identify people who might be good candidates. But then we interview anybody who wants to come and see us. So in the last two years for this election, we've had over 350 interviews in our office with candidates. We, We research their record if they've been like a mayor or a state representative or state senator, and we'll ask them the tough questions. You know, everybody can read on our website that we're for lower taxes, less regulation, uh, lower spending. And they usually say that's what they're for. But then if they had a vote for a big tax increase when they were in the state legislature, we start asking them, how how does that fit with what you tell us your principles are? Um, Because we recognize politicians will tell you what they think you wanna hear uh, to to get support. And that process winnows it down to about probably about 30 races in this election cycle. We're very involved in the primaries in, because 
in essence, the Republican Party is the message carrier for free markets and less government, even though not all Republicans really believe that or act on that. And so we try to upgrade the members of Congress and the senators to be people who will really fight for those when they come to Washington. Then the best way to do that is to elect people in primaries. Uh, we'll do it in open seats. Occasionally, we'll challenge a sitting member. Um, you know, we, we had one race like that with Kate Granger in Texas. We, we ended up not winning, but we sent the message that if you're an appropriator spending a ton of money, uh, the Republican base isn't going to be happy with you on that. And then once we've researched, found some really good candidates, we test to see, do they have a chance to win? Because my board told me basically, don't pad your results, David. Don't pick a bunch of easy wins that you weren't really needed for. And don't pick the impossible race, even if you have like the perfect person. You know, Milton Friedman, say, running for Congress somewhere, um, but he's running in the middle of a Democrat district in the, in the downtown of some major city. We can't help that person get over the finish line. So um, what we do is pick those races where we would make a difference and then invest a lot. Our members send contributions. We've got about 10,000 people around the country. They'll send anywhere from $10 to the maximum $2,800. And then we also come in with our super PAC. And used to be it would mean that maybe an extra 500 to 750,000. I'll have to tell you, Alex, that it's gotten expensive this year because the Democrats have been raising so much money that in many of our races, it's, we're now investing a million and a half to two million or even more. And is that largely advertising? What, what does that investment go to? Yeah. And we've got a pretty sophisticated way of analyzing the voters and what's the best way to reach them. Typically, the most efficient is a television ad. But say you've got somebody in Orange County, where it'd be Los Angeles TV market, it's not worth paying for that whole market to have a TV ad that maybe hits 1 50th of the people that live in that district. So there we would do cable, digital ads on the internet and mail. And so it depends on the district and what we think is the best way to reach the voters. It also, um, we segment out and look at the poll, who are the persuadable voters? Um, you typically Republicans are gonna vote for Republicans and Democrats for Democrats, but there's somewhere 15 to 30% in the middle that haven't made up their mind and will advertise focus in on them, TV shows they watch, mail directly to them. And so it's become a, a fairly sophisticated way of stretching the, the dollars that we spend so they go farther and have a bigger impact. Got it. So in terms of this election, what, what to you and to the Club for Growth are the biggest issues this election? I think this election is so yeah, you just have to acknowledge it. Part of it's a referendum on Donald Trump and his style of leadership. Um, that generally cuts against him and the Republicans with suburban voters in particular. But when you get past that, I think this election really comes down to a choice about what the role of government should be. Um, Trump has been very conservative, free market in his orientation, promoting deregulation, promoting uh, parental choice in education and lowering taxes. Biden has adopted Bernie Sanders' radical left agenda that would increase taxes like $4 billion, trillion, and, and that's a huge impact on the economy. It would shut down the carbon-based energy system in 15 years. That's stated as their goal. Um, they would eliminate charter schools, for example, so even fewer choices as schools are closed with COVID. It, it is a complete diametrically opposed choice between what's good for America at this point. Is freedom and free markets and rebuilding after COVID based on the strengths that have always made us a great country and a great economy? Or do we make a sharp turn to the left and go to socialism and unfortunately, any economist that is serious and not just political about it and will tell you almost all of those provisions will have a cost on the economy and, and reduce people's take-home pay. They'll reduce their choices for products they can get. Uh, they'll 
increase the, what they pay to drive or travel anywhere as you get rid of gasoline and, and other natural gas as their heating product. So a huge, huge impact. And, and I think those economic issues are what's going to drive this election more than anything else. I'm curious as with the issue of socialism. It, it, I mean, it's sad to those of us who are aware of socialism's history that this is a word that people have positive associations with. If I believed in trigger words, that would be the number one trigger word I would have a negative association with, just given the amount of murder that has been used, uh, occurred under under socialism. I'm, I'm curious, how do you feel like the, the rights or the pro-freedom movement's countering of that has been? And in particular, why why am I not seeing more mention of Venezuela? I mean, we have this country that's a, adopted progressively more socialism in the last couple of decades, and it's just this case study, kind of like California is for electricity at the moment. Yeah. And I, I can, and nobody is talking uh, about it. No, you're absolutely right because, and one of our board members, uh, Freda Levy, who also chairs AFP, a very a grassroots activist for freedom and free markets. She has met two young people from Venezuela who tell the story of what happened there. And, and when you hear them, it's, it's bone chilling because they said it started out with promises of free healthcare, of free college education, and they had oil money at the time to pay for all of that. Well, when the oil market dropped and the prices were gone, suddenly they were completely bankrupt. The legitimate government couldn't handle it and the Chavez and the communists came in, took over and then completely destroyed the economy by putting in pure socialist principles, right? Uh, they were gonna pay the people out in the oil fields the same thing they were gonna pay a janitor at a restaurant. And basically people stopped working in, in the hard labor jobs when they weren't getting paid. Um, and that destroyed all of their hopes. And then the response to that was more oppression, right? Bring in the military, force people to do things. It was a, a total disaster and very, as you point out, very telling of what could happen here if we don't guard our freedoms really every day and at the outset. Well, let's now talk about freedom in the realm of energy uh, in particular, which is a focus of this show. So think about two weeks ago, I reached out to you and I said, I got this website, energytalkingpoints.com. And uh, you seem to like it. And, and can you just tell us what, I mean, I know, at least I think I know, but can you tell us what you've done so far as the Club for Growth to promote these messages? Yes, um, they're fantastic messages. And, and anybody listening to the podcast, I recommend you go to the website, look and see what Alex has put up there. Uh, because what they do is put out the argument for why we need a robust market in energy that includes all sources of energy, right? And that how important that is for our standard of living. Uh, the the fact that we enjoy, you know, the be able to travel anywhere, the fact we can enjoy air conditioning, as people are finding out in, in California when they don't have enough electricity, that air conditioning is one of the things that goes, uh, that we can live a higher standard of life, healthier lives, and more freedom of choices for us. You're, the way you distilled it, to me, said this is something that political leaders can use and go to the people they represent or candidates can use and go to the voters and say, here is why I am for freedom and energy and against what Biden and Bernie Sanders want to do to completely take over the energy. Not only will it, it destroy our standard of living, you've got government bureaucrats telling you what to set your thermostat at. You'll have them telling you whether you can go driving on certain days. You'll, they'll tell you whether you can, um, continue to fly in airplanes even. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible the amount of control that would come from the left's approach to taking over and controlling the energy sector. And your, your talking points on that website said it beautifully. So what we did was we posted it, we published it in there. We, the lawyers told us we couldn't quite tell our, the candidates we endorsed you have to use these, but we, we told everybody about them and said, go see it, talk to Alex. One of the great things on your website is, I think you start it by saying, hey, if you want more information or you wanna discuss this, I'm available. And thank you for doing that. Thank you for taking your time to really help. 
what I found, I, you know, I ran for Congress a while back in, when Newt Gingrich got the majority, and I noticed that a lot of political leaders have a gut instinct for the philosophy they believe in, or it's the side of the aisle are on. Republicans tend to be more conservatives than Democrats. But they haven't really thought through how do we take those ideas and tell people in ways that it's meaningful to them. You know, most people don't want to hear about bureaucracy in Washington or the complicated way a bill is made. But they will st sit up and pay attention if you tell them, look, if we do this, uh, your gas prices are going to double. And that's, that's going to be the consequence for you and your family. And so the way you've distilled this message lets leaders be able to convey it more effectively to the broad public and to voters if they're in a campaign. Oh, awesome. Well, I'm really glad uh, you did that. So you actually send, so you, th these candidates, you said you've interviewed hundreds of candidates, so these, they got exposed to it? Yeah, what we did was posted it publicly and then, then legally we could send it to everybody we interviewed. Um, so about 350 people who've run for Congress, many of them still running for Congress, and said, hey, this is a good message. Um, it'll help you with uh, on how you communicate about this issue. Uh, look at it, reach out to Alex, and, and use it wherever possible. Um, awesome. I'm, I'm, I have a couple of questions about this. One is, I know, I'm, you know, you, I think you're unusually interested in these issues because one thing I, I found as I'm promoting this to different people, not everyone is int that interested in energy and environmental issues, though I, I really think they, they should be because energy yeah. is the industry that powers every other uh, industry and powers our standard of living. But I'm curious in your background, what got you interested in energy and environmental issues? So before I ran for office, I worked um, a couple different jobs in the Reagan and Bush administration. And one of them was working for H.W. Uh, Bush, the father, and Dan Quayle, the vice president, in a group called the Competitiveness Council. And our job was to look over all the federal regulations to make sure they were consistent with the president's policies and they promoted economic growth wherever possible. Um, we found that the environmental regulations dealing with energy were some of the most restrictive and anti-freedom, anti-free markets. And so in order to, to kind of win those policy battles, I had to dig deep and learn a lot about energy and how, it's, how the markets work there um, and, and how the environmental regulations create barriers to that and barriers to freedom. Then later in life, I was, after I finished Congress, I was with the law firm and, and some of our clients uh, were in the energy sector. They, in order to represent them, because basically they'd hire me to, to talk to the regulatory agencies, they wanted me to understand how their business works. So I remember one company explained to me how the pricing for different grades of gasoline occurred and that um, government regulations that changed in the summer ostensibly to have cleaner fuels created a huge um, opportunity for them to actually extract more money because if you had smaller markets, uh, they were able to charge more to the consumers. And so I realized, uh, you know, things that ostensibly are supposed to help us with the environment end up actually costing people more than they should, just from that real world experience of, of working with people in the industry. Um, and so that background has told me, in some ways, the, the regulatory issues that are, can be very boring, right? When, when I used to speak on them when I was working for Vice President Quayle, I think I put more audiences to sleep talking about rules and regulations. Um, but they're so important for economic growth. It, I think even more than reducing taxes, cutting back on regulations, uh, one way to measure them is they cost us about 15000 per employee for businesses to comply with all the federal regulations. If you can scale that back, that's more take-home pay that they can pay their employees for. And that's just one way to look at it. Um, you've looked at it a lot of different ways of what it what will do in terms of affecting lifestyle. And do we really get the benefits we expect from, from some of these different environmental regulations? 
I'm curious when you were, uh, actually, you made a comment to me, I think last time we talked on the phone that I thought was really uh, insightful. I think you, if, if I'm remembering correctly, I think you described the EPA as one giant takings. Is that, is that right? <laughs> yes. And can so, you explain that, that point? Um, when early on in my career, I was working for President Reagan and a little known fact at the end of his administration, he wrote an executive order telling the agencies to the extent possible, don't engage in regulatory takings. Don't, don't issue regulations that take private property um, because the constitution protects that in the fifth amendment. You can't take private property without just compensation and you don't get compensated if the regulation says you can't build a house on your beachfront property, for example. Well, I was, we were talking to the different general counsels to implement this and the general counsel at EPA, who's a good guy and tried to bring in market solutions, he just turned to me with a little bit of a chuckle and said, David, uh, everything we do here is a taking. Um, and I've always realized, yes, the, the EPA is a giant taking of private property rights uh, by imposing these costs on private individuals without government or society compensating them for what they're doing. Uh, now, some of them you can argue, I don't know if you're familiar with Richard Epstein, who wrote a book about takings. Um, he was one of my law school professors, so I've studied it. Um, he will argue, for example, that allowing airplanes to fly over your property, which technically is a taking because you don't get paid for letting the airplanes do that. He will argue that society, the benefits to everybody outweigh the cost to any individual private property owner. And so that as a society-wide rule that you can fly over everybody's property, it's not in the end the taking. But most government regulations, as you're aware of, target specific companies, they target specific farmers and landowners. Um, and so those really do amount to taking some value of their private property. Yeah, this, uh, this is such an interesting issue. I mean, uh, my basic view is that, you know, the government environmentally it, it should be, def I mean, there's questions of how do you define property rights properly, including where does an airplane fit in, where do certain kinds of air pollutants fill in. But the whole approach of the EPA is basically to just to say, oh, there's some dictator that gets to decide all of these things for us. And Congress basically gives us it, it unlimited power, as we've seen. I mean, it can even, like a law about air pollution decades ago can then include CO2, which is not wait, air pollution. We just see wait. the arbitrariness of the power. I, I point out to everybody, um, everyone exhales CO2 every breath they take, right? So Congress didn't intend that to be labeled a pollutant, and yet they've grabbed it and, and forced everybody to start changing their economic behavior based on, on CO2 content. Um, yeah, let me back up a little bit, because once again, I went into takings as a label, but but for folks who aren't haven't gone to law school, haven't thought about that. Essentially, what that says is private property rights, the ability to control what you own, um, whether it's um, the car you own or whether it's the land and the house you own, though the right to control that is fundamental to our free market system, right? People have those rights, they trade back and forth. I'll let you rent my property if you pay me a certain amount of money. And that's how the marketplace works. When the government comes in and takes those away, they're supposed to pay compensation for it because that the Constitution recognized those private property rights were so important. Um, but also, every time they take it away without a justifiable public purpose, it ends up meaning that the economy is diminished, right? We can do less because people have less freedom to trade back and forth to use the property the way they want to. Uh, now, the law has always said you can't impose harm onto somebody else by what you do on your private property. And so you can justify some of the, the measures against pollution that way. You can't um, light a fire that's poisonous and have the wind carry it down over to your neighbor. Um, that you, you have the right to build a fire, but you can't impose the cost of that fire on somebody else. So there's a lot of law behind that. But that fundamental notion that private property, it's the difference between the US, for example, and China. We, we try to trade with China. We believe in free trade at the Club for Growth. 
but China still doesn't recognize property rights. Communist countries do not believe in private property. They think property is the, owned by the government and they, the government gives you permission to use your own property. In the US, it's the other way around. We believe people own the private property and the government through legitimate due process of law can call on you to give up property to be part of the government, but you still own it and it's yours. Yeah, this is a really uh, important issue. I'm glad, I'm glad we're covering this. So let me shift back to energy and talking points. Uh, since you, you have a lot of experience influencing people, so I'm just curious for my own knowledge, what have you learned about influence, particularly influence in Washington that I can incorporate in trying to change the discussion on energy? Yeah, I, I've, I was thinking about that. Um, I think a couple lessons. One, and I don't, I don't want to get too cynical about this, but the, as government has gotten bigger and more money is at stake based on what they spend it on and what they regulate, um, special interests will spend a lot of money to have the government take positions that help them. You know, businesses sometimes benefit by regulations because it makes their competitors have a more difficult time competing. So you've, you've got to recognize behind decisions in Washington, a lot of times there are these self-interested special interests advocating one way or the other. Um, the second lesson is a little more optimistic, which is you can overcome those private special interests when the public is engaged and the public expresses their interest. You know, as a member of Congress, we paid attention as soon as we got 10 or 11 letters on something because we realized, oh, they're for those 10 or 11 people, there are probably hundreds more that are thinking the same thing but didn't take time to write me. Um, so organizing people to engage with their representatives in the Washington government in Washington is really important. And, and that voice outside of Washington can make a difference. You're still going to have to contend with those private interests and they're very sophisticated. Uh, politicians end up getting money from them for campaigns, and so they pay attention to those private interests. But they also know the, the voters can trump the, the funding they get from these special interests. And so if you can organize the voters, uh, to make it'll make a big difference. In terms of I'm encouraging people to contact their representatives, is the easiest way to just go through their website? Like what's the best way these days of contacting yeah, representative uh, in a way that's that they're going to take seriously? That's an easy way. It's a little bit easier, easy to ignore that or just put it into a process where they send back a letter or an email. Um, a phone call actually is one of the best ways because once they get several phone calls, those that's registered. Um, it, it's still it's still it's interesting, but that personal touch is is still very important. Um, I think show, when they're in their districts where they live, coming to a town meeting or a conference they're having and speaking up when there's an open mic, um, that you would be surprised. But people, it's natural. It's very human, right? You, they're getting that feedback. And in some ways, it has a bigger impact than maybe uh, the number of people would care about it because somebody spoke up and made a strong case for it. So th those would be three ways that I would urge people to engage. Yeah, I like that phone call idea. I'm going to tell people on my list this week to just actually uh, call your representative and tell them to look at this and tell them you yeah. want them to stand for this. Yeah, I think that's good. It helps um, it, it, in two ways. If they haven't made up their mind, it, they, they're balancing what the input is. If they are on our side on the issue, it helps give them courage to fight even harder for it. Uh, great. Well, um, as we wrap up, I want to just go back to the Club for Growth and what you're doing. You mentioned on the website, it says you have 250,000 members. Is that right? Yes. So what is that? What does it mean to be a member? What do those people do? Yeah. Um, so you can sign up on our website, clubforgrowth.org to join for free. There's no cost to become a member. Most of those members follow us on the issues and we'll call on them periodically to make phone calls or, or email uh, their senator or their house member. Within that, there are probably about 15 to 20,000 members who contribute to candidates. And so 
that's voluntary. But what, as you sign up to be a member, we'll send you the list of who the really good champions are for pro growth, free market, and liberty. And each election, now we're up to about 30 in an election, there'll, there'll be choices. And if you are inspired and want to help that person out, you, we make it easy. You can just uh, use a credit card, send them $10, $15 or more. Um, that is grouped together with a lot of other contributions, and so it has a big impact. They, they see it coming from the Club for Growth, and they realize, okay, the, this, this is a group that's supporting me as I'm trying to run for office. Uh, but again, that's all up to each individual. They can pick and choose what they want to do. One of the things I think that's really good about our, our website is it keeps you posted on the latest battles on a lot of these economic issues. Um, and we post stories and, and different things that senators are doing. I also try to send out a weekly newsletter that focuses on something that's going on in Washington that you might not have heard about. Uh, great. Okay, well, that, we covered everything I wanted to cover. Any final thoughts you have for our audience about this election or anything they should, you think they should know or do? So politicians will always say, this is the most important election, right? And for them, in some ways, it is. Will they get to keep their job or not? Uh, but I really believe this is one of those watershed elections in our country where the contrast is so great between keeping you know, our basic private sector freedoms and limited government or moving dramatically, you know, we label it socialism, but moving dramatically to having government have a big and heavy hand in everything in our lives and controlling our lives a lot more and in doing it in ways that will make us poorer and less well off. Um, and that's the choice before us. So uh, let me absolutely urge everyone watching the podcast be sure and vote. If, if you're not comfortable going to a voting place, vote early by mail. Um, you can, they, by the way, you can track to make sure that the ballot actually gets there if you're worried about the post office. Um, and vote, vote for the candidates you think who will protect your freedom. I think that's the most important thing we can do at this time in our life. And voting actually matters? It totally matters. Um, it, it's going to matter in a lot of local races that are going to be closely done. In about 10 states, it's going to pick who the next president is. And many of those states will be, you know, a 0.1% difference between the two. So it's going to be very close seesawing back and forth. It'll matter in more states on who controls the U.S. Senate. Uh, which determines the Supreme Court, determines whether we continue to have a filibuster, a procedure that protects minority rights. Um, lots at stake, so it, it absolutely matters to vote. Um, you wouldn't believe the number of elections I've seen that, when we've been involved in some, where, where the difference was you know, a handful, 18 votes in, in one case in Arizona a couple of years ago. Um, so, uh, and if 18 people had showed up the other way, we would have lost that. Um, and, and it makes a big difference. Wow. And just to, so people know that clubforgrowth.org, is that the website? Yes, it is. Love to have you join. All right. Well, David, thanks so much for coming. And thanks so much for promoting uh, my talking points. I think it's really going to help some candidates have better pro-freedom messaging on energy this year. And, and let me invite you, Alex, uh, give us feedback on what you're hearing from folks too, so we can know if there are other ways to promote it. And as you update and hear about new issues, I'd, I'd be love to be in touch with you on that. Awesome. Will do. Thanks a lot, David. Great. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thanks again to David McIntosh for joining me on the show. I really like his idea, and I just want to emphasize it now, of calling your congressperson so just look up, and this is a simple thing to do, just look up, uh, look up their website. It's got to have a phone number on it, and you can just call them and say something uh, really simple. And you can say, I just want to make sure that Congressperson X has seen the website energytalkingpoints.com. I think energy and energy freedom is a really important issue. I'd like to see the congressperson talk about it more. And I'd really like you guys to check out this website and let me know what you think and hopefully use some of the important facts that, they, that that website shares. And you can say it's not my website, but I think it's really good. So just something simple like that. If 
a thousand people listening to this did it with various Congress people, I guarantee a bunch of Congress people would listen. And there are way more than a thousand people who listen to this show. So try that. Just try doing it for one minute and report back to me what happens. Not I'm not sure if I'm allowed to bribe you for doing it, like through an I Love Fossil Fuels t-shirt. So just for now, don't, no bribe, except you can make potentially a big difference in a small amount of time. And just, yeah, tell me about it. And, and whatever happens, let me know. So just email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Also, if you can think of any other pro-freedom organizations or people or candidates uh, who might be interested in this, in energytalkingpoints.com, please, please, please keep promoting it. That This is how it's spreading, is just people promoting it. Every time you do this, it just, it has a bigger chance of getting traction. And we're going to have energy issues are going to become bigger and bigger as we get closer to the election. And I would like people to actually know what they're talking about. And for the people who are fighting for freedom to actually have the words that they need, that can be really, really effective. So thanks for sharing energytalkingpoints.com and keep doing it. I'm going to keep uh, updating it. I haven't updated it as much in the last couple of weeks because I've really been focused on the promotional aspect, but many more updates coming soon, plus the stuff that's there is already a lot more than most candidates know. And there's already a ton of timeless content for them to use. All right, that is it for this week. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. If you don't get our weekly newsletter, make sure to subscribe. Just go to industrialprogress.com, sign up for the newsletter. You can follow me on all the social media channels. Uh, I should, I never say this, but Subscribe to Power Hour on your podcast platform or subscribe to the channel. If, this, if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to the Improve the, uh, the Planet channel. I, that seems to be best, practices, best practice to encourage people to do that. So I'm going to try doing that because I'm trying to put out really high quality content. And if you subscribe, you will get it more consistently. I feel like I'm missing uh, something. So we've got the newsletter. Oh, Two more things. Uh, if you are interested in any kind of speaker, I've been doing more and more virtual events. I actually did my first live event in a while, a week and a half ago. That was really cool. It's a nice outdoor area. I have another one in September. So I'm certainly available uh, for live in-person events, but also for virtual events. They're pretty discounted now because of the economy. I hope the supply demand situation changes, but if you've always wanted to have me speak, now is definitely, I would unless I really fail in life, now is the lowest cost that you'll be able to get it uh, indefinitely. So let me know uh, about that. And hopefully I'm available on the dates that you need. And you can just email me at alex at alexepstein.com for that. And then the other thing is to, if you want to support our projects, including energytalkingpoints.com, including the new version of the Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, consider becoming a CIP accelerator. And you can learn about that at industrialprogress.com slash accelerate. I always try to emphasize this money doesn't go toward staff, doesn't go toward me, toward administrative expenses. All of it goes toward research and development or promotional efforts. And what that means is every dollar is accelerating progress. You're not, you're not paying for us to exist, but you're paying for us to do, uh, to have more and more influence faster and faster. All right. That is really it. Uh, for this week, have a couple of uh, guests already in the queue for the next several weeks. So I, I expect that I'll learn a lot and you'll learn a lot as well. I'll be back next week. Until then, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.